Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering part two of depression, suicide, and suicide ideations. Now, if you haven't watched part one already, you don't really have to watch part one, then watch part two, but I encourage you to make sure you go back and watch part one. There's lots of important information and concepts and principles that you absolutely need to understand for psychiatric nursing in regards to this subject. Before we get started, as always, I'm gonna ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to this channel if you haven't done so already, and don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Also keep in mind, guys, if you are interested in practicing nursing questions daily, you guys can check me out um, on my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So I'd like to start off this video with a prayer. If you're not into that, no problem. Just go ahead and fast forward. And if you are, close your eyes, bow your head. Father God, thank you, Lord, for another opportunity you've given us, this breath of life in our bodies. Father God, thank you for allowing us to go over this information. Lord, I pray for every single viewer that's watching right now. I pray that you please help them to understand these concepts, help them to understand these principles, help them to be able to think critically through these test questions and learn how to eliminate wrong answer choices and learn how to figure out what the correct answer choice is. Father God, I ask that you please help them in their studies. Please give them the motivation to even want to study, Lord. Father God, I ask that you please remove those obstacles that are acting as hindrances to them to either studying or doing well on their exams, Father God. Lord, I wanna say a special prayer for the loved ones and the support systems of every single viewer, those people who are giving them the motivation to keep going and they are cheering them on. Lord, I ask that you please bless them. Thank you for all that you've done and all you continue to do in Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. The widow of a client who successfully completed suicide tearfully says, I feel guilty because I'm so angry at him for killing himself. It must have been what he wanted. After assisting the widow with dealing with her feelings, which of the following is most helpful? One, referring her to a group of survivors of suicide. Two, encouraging her to receive counseling from a chaplain. Three, providing her with a local suicide hotline number. Or four, suggesting she receive individual therapy by the nurse. Let me adjust my camera a little bit. And guys, the correct answer is one, referring her to a group for survivors of suicide. So in this group, she will um, meet other people who have had the same similar experience and um, she'll learn how they have learned to overcome it or how they're processing it, how they're currently going through the process. And she can, all, she can also get um, that sense of community while she's getting that therapy. So that is a correct answer, guys. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Two, encourage her to receive counseling from a chaplain. There's nothing in this question that says that she's even religious. Choice three, providing her with a local suicide hotline number. There's nothing in the question that says that she's suicidal. Choice four, suggesting she receive individual therapy by the nurse. What individual therapy by the nurse? She needs a support group. So number one's a correct answer. And if anything, if we suspected that this patient was maybe suicidal, the first thing we'd ask, are you having thoughts of harming yourself for others? So we would be doing that first before we even knew if this patient would need therapy at all. And if uh, with that, who would it be going to? We, we'd go ahead and pump that out. We'd refer that, right? So they wouldn't be getting therapy from a nurse. So the correct answer here, guys, again, is number one, um, a group for survivors of suicide, that's gonna, you're killing two birds with one stone. That patient is going to get the community that she's gonna need. She's gonna need to be able to talk to people who have gone through what they've gone through. So when somebody says to her, I know how you feel, they really do. They really do. And they can kind of give her some, some tips on how they were able to get through it. Next question. The husband of a client to be discharged from the hospital after an episode of major depression and a suicide attempt asks, what can I do if she tries to kill herself again? Which of the following responses is most appropriate? One, don't worry, she'll be okay as long as she takes her medication. Two, she told me she wants to live so I don't think she'll try again. Three, let's talk about some behavioral clues and resources that can help. Four, tell her about your concern and just take care of her. 
And the correct answer is three. Let's talk about some uh, behavior clues and resources that can help. So number one, let's talk about some clues, some cues. So if you see this type of behavior being manifested, okay, that might be a red flag. Maybe she's going to attempt it again so you can kind of catch it early. That's number one. And number two, let's get some resources that can help you. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, don't worry. Do we ever tell a patient, don't worry? Do we ever say, don't worry, period? Never. You never offer false reassurances. You never say, don't worry. You never say why. You never say what made you ever. That is not therapeutic. So that's wrong. Choice two, she told me she wants to live, so I don't think. Since when do we give our opinions in nursing? Since when are our opinions therapeutic? Absolutely not. False. Choice four, tell her about your concern and just take care of her. So now we're putting the weight of this on the, on the, on the caregiver, on the spouse. We're saying just take care of the patient and nothing will happen. So now if they do kill themselves, they got to live with that guilt for the rest of their life because you want to do the most with your responses to the caregiver. Absolutely not. We're not going to put that weight on the spouse, on the caregiver. And guess what? It doesn't help. It absolutely doesn't help. Telling someone who is suicidal your concerns really doesn't help if you're not actually doing things actively to try to prevent it from happening. And that's why number three is the correct answer. Let me educate you on some clues that are red flags that she may be try to attempt it again. And let me get some resources to help you in the prevention of this happening again. A client with depression is exhibiting a brighter affect, ability to attend hygiene and grooming tasks, and beginning participation in group activities. The nurse asks the client to identify three of her strengths. After much hesitation and thinking, the client can state that she's usually a nice person, a good cook, and a hard worker. Which of the following should the nurse do next? One, ask the client to identify an additional three strengths. Two, volunteer the client to lead the cooking group later in the day. Three, educate the client about the importance of medication. Or four, reinforce the client for identifying and sharing her strengths. And the correct answer is four. Reinforce the client for identifying their um, strengths. So go back to the question. It says after you ask them to say what their strengths are, it says after much hesitation. So it took the patient a while after much hesitation and thinking, the client can state that X, Y, Z. So it took them a while. So why would we do A, ask them for another three? Don't you think that would be overwhelming? Remember, depression is anger, hostility, resentment turns inside. So the patient already feels like, I'm not good enough. I suck. I'm horrible. It took them this long just to come up with a couple good things about themselves and you're going to push them for another three? False. Choice two, volunteer them to lead the cooking group later in the day. That's going to be too overwhelming for them as well. Remember, they feel like they're not good enough. And so these patients who are severely depressed, you cannot put them in any situation where there's a possibility that they're going to fail because all that's going to do is reinforce the thought that I'm so horrible. I suck. So that's wrong. Choice three, educate, educate the client about the importance of medication. Remember how I, well, I say this a lot, but remember how I said on several videos, um, when you're looking at different test questions, you usually see two, ans two right answers, right? But you have to look at the answer that's right for your question. Even though choice three is a great answer, it's always good to educate the patient about their medications. Absolutely. But in this situation, is that the best thing to do? After it took them forever just to come up with some good things about themselves, you're going to switch gears and start talking about the medication. What do you think you're going? To, you're telling your patient when you do that? You're telling the patient, you know what? I really don't agree with you. Oh, you think you're a nice person? Mm, anyway, let's talk about your meds. Absolutely not. After it took them so long just to come up with some positive um, aspects of themselves, you're going to reinforce that. You're going to do number four. Next question. The friend of a client with depression and suicidal ideation asks the nurse, how should I act around her? Which of the following responses by the nurse is best? One, try to cheer her up. Two, be caring and genuine. Three, control your expressions. Or four, avoid asking how she's feeling. 
And the correct answer is two, be caring and genuine. Just like you can spot a fake or someone insincere a mile away, so can they. So just be your be yourself, be honest, be genuine, be caring. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, try to cheer her up, that's overwhelming. That patient who is going through severe depression, one of the things they may feel is pressure to act happy or act normal. So the more you try to cheer them up, the more pressure they feel to smile and pretend like everything's okay when it's really not. And that's not what you want from them. You want them to be able to verbalize and express how they're feeling. Because remember, anger, resentment, hostility turn towards self. You want them to turn that out. You want them to get it out. You want them to express themselves. So you don't want to put them under that type of pressure where they have to fake being happy because you keep trying to cheer them up. So that's false. Choice three, control your expressions. So you're not gonna show when you're happy. You're not gonna show when you're sad. You're not gonna show when you're concerned. That's being fake. They can spot that and you're gonna, you're gonna increase their anxiety. You're gonna make them feel like something's wrong with them, that, you're, that they're making the situation awkward when you're the ones making the situation awkward. So that's wrong. And then choice four, ask, um, excuse me, avoid asking how she's feeling. If you don't ask that at all, you want to know what a person with anger, hostility, resentment, turn towards self, you want to know what they're going to think? You know what? I was right. I'm such a loser. Even my loved ones don't care how I'm doing. That's why they didn't ask because they don't care. So you don't want to avoid that. You want to show caring. You want to show compassion. You want to know how they're doing. Number two is the correct answer choice. A 68-year-old client has improved with medication and treatment and no longer experiences suicidal ideation. She can manage her diabetic care and understands her diet requirements. She'll be discharged to live alone in her apartment. Visits by which of the following caregivers are most important for the nurse to arrange before the client's discharge? One, psychiatric home care nurse. Two, a medical social worker. Three, minister. Or four, occupational therapist. And guys, the correct answer, the only correct answer here is one, psychiatric home care nurse. Why? If she starts to decline, this needs to be caught immediately. So you need one, a psychiatric home care nurse because you're kidding two birds with one stone. Number one, this is a psych nurse. So they'll be able to pick up on those cues a lot quicker because this is their specialty. So if the patient starts to decline, they can um, get the patient help immediately, reach out to the healthcare provider, number one. And number two, um, they, can have, they can provide that medical intervention as needed. Number one is the correct answer choice. A client who overdosed on barbiturates is being transferred to the inpatient psychiatric unit from the intensive care unit. When assessing, excuse me, assessing the client for which of the following needs should be a priority for the nurse receiving the client in the intensive care unit. One, nutrition. Two, sleep. Three, safety. Or four, hygiene. And the correct answer is three, safety. If that patient is not alive, if that patient is not safe, do we care about nutrition, sleep, or hygiene? Absolutely not. Safety is our priority. A client's brought to the psychiatric unit from the emergency department, escorted by emergency department staff and a security officer. The client's shoulder is bandaged and his arm is in a sling because of a self-inflicted gunshot wound to his shoulder. Later, the client's wife follows with a bag of her husband's belongings. Which of the following nursing actions is most appropriate at this time? One, tell the wife to take her husband's things home because he's suicidal. Two, instruct the wife to unpack the bag and put her husband's things in the dresser. Three, ask the wife whether the bag contains anything dangerous. Or four, inspect the bag and its contents in the presence of the client and his wife. And guys, the correct answer is number four. Inspect the bag and its contents in the presence of the client and his wife. That is your responsibility as a nurse. And as you're taking the things out of the bag, anything that is contraband, anything that is not allowed, you're gonna tell the wife, this is not allowed, this is why it can harm the patient, you have to take this home. It cannot stay on the unit. 
Now, let's go through the wrong answer choices. One, tell the wife to take her husband's things home because he's suicidal. Just because he's suicidal doesn't mean he can't have any personal belongings. He may want a photo of his wife or his children or, you know, lotion, whatever it is. So there are personal belongings that he absolutely is allowed to have. So that's false. Two, instruct the wife to unpack the bag and put her husband's things in the dresser. You cannot do that. That is your responsibility to go through everything first because you have to make sure anything that is not safe that can put that patient or the um, other patient, the, the safety of the other patients on the unit, put that them in harm, you have to remove and you know give it back to the wife until she has to take it home. Choice three, ask the wife whether the bag contains anything dangerous. The patient may have a razor and the wife may not think it's dangerous. It's just a razor. The husband shaves every day, but that may be something that the husband may use to <laughs> himself, right? So you don't put that responsibility on the wife. You do it yourself. That's why number four is the correct answer choice. A client's placed in the seclusion room and given lorazepam Ativan because she tried to harm herself by banging her head against the wall. After 10 minutes, the client starts to bang her head against the wall in the seclusion room. Which of the following should the nurse do next? One, tell the client to stop doing that and act like a responsible adult. Two, place the client in leather restraints. Three, call the physician for additional medication orders. Or four, instruct the staff member to sit in the room with the client. Okay, the correct answer is two. Safety is always first. You're going to put that patient in restraints and then immediately call the healthcare provider and get orders. Safety first. Let's look at the wrong answer. One, tell the client to stop doing that and act like a responsible adult. First of all, if they've gotten to the point that they're banging their heads against the wall, they've completely lost control. So you telling them to stop is not going to make them suddenly have control over their bodies and make them stop banging their head, right? Right. Also, that's not therapeutic. Remember, psych is all about therapeutic communication. Choice three, call the physician for additional medication. Go back to the question. We just gave him Ativan and it's only been 10 minutes. So this medication is not even fully in their system. And so think about, I want you to think about this. While this patient is literally banging their head, you're on the phone with the healthcare provider. While the patient's still banging their head saying, hey, I need more medication. While the patient's still banging their head, come on, safety first. You're gonna put that patient in restraints. Then you're gonna call the healthcare provider, tell them what happened, be like, I need an order for those restraints and I just put the patient in. Last, instruct the staff member to sit in the room. Like my son says, BFR, be for real. So, this patient is banging their head on the wall. And while they're banging their head on the wall, you're going to have a staff member going to be with the patient while they're banging their head on the wall. What kind of sense does that make? It says instruct a staff member to sit in the room with the client. But remember what the client's doing. They're banging their head on the wall. Safety comes first. You're going to put that patient in restraints and get an order for it immediately after. A client lives in a group home and visits a community mental health center regularly. During one visit with the nurse, the client states, the voices are telling me to hurt myself again. Which of the following questions by the nurse is most important to ask? One, when do you hear voices? Two, are you going to hurt yourself? Three, how long have you heard the voices? Or four, why are the voices starting again? And if you watch part one, I know you know the answer to this question. What is it? Two. Are you going to hurt yourself? First of all, um, when the patient's hearing voices to hurt themselves or voices to do something, those are what's known as command hallucinations. And command hallucinations are the most dangerous type of hallucinations that a patient can have. And the reason for that, the minute they hear those voices telling them to do something, they feel compelled to follow through with whatever the voices are telling them to do. Even if, even if the voices are telling them to jump out of that third story window, they feel compelled to do it. So the fact that this person is saying that the voices are have come back and they're telling them to hurt themselves, remember, whenever you even suspect somebody's suicidal, what is the first thing you do? You ask them, are you having thoughts of harming yourself or anyone else?
And if they say yes, the next thing you say is, do you have a plan? You want to find out the lethality of the plan. You want to find out if they have access to uh, carry out the um, form of suicide that they say they have a plan for. Okay? So number two is the correct answer choice. A 20-year-old client diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia is recovering from his first psychotic break. Before discharge from the hospital, the client becomes depressed and states, I don't want this illness. I'm about to begin my junior year in college. Which of the following issues would be most important for the nurse to address at this time? One, disturbed thought process. Two, disturbed sensory perception. Three, communication problems. Or four, potential for medication noncompliance. And guys, it's almost 2 a.m. I'm recording this video, so I'm exhausted. I had a long day. I have to drink my coffee. So the, the person who had a problem with me drinking coffee on the video, I don't know what to tell you. Press mute because I'm about to go. Whew. Okay. So the correct answer choice is four. Potential for non, uh, excuse me, potential for medication non-compliance. This person's in college, which means they're um, adolescent, young adult, mostly young adult, right? They still care about their social group. They still care about fitting in. They still care about not being the oddball. They just said to us, they don't want this illness and they're about to start their junior year in college. We're gonna be concerned that they're gonna stop taking their medications and guess what? Those hallucinations, those delusions come back. Look at the wrong answer choices. Look at one and two, disturbed thought process and disturbed sensory perceptions. Well, that's part of the disease process. That's why the patient's on medications. Choice three, communication problems. There's nothing, there's no evidence in the question that tells us the patient has any communication problems. So what we're gonna be concerned is that they're gonna stop taking their medication. We're concerned about noncompliance. The nurse is teaching two nursing assistants who are new to the inpatient unit about caring for a client who is suicidal. The nurse determines that additional teaching is needed when which of the following medications, excuse me, when which of the following statements is made. One, I need to check the client precisely at 15 minute intervals. Two, documenting suicide checks is absolutely necessary. Three, clients on one-to-one -one suicide precautions can never be left alone. Or four, all clients using razors must be supervised by staff. And the correct answer, guys, is number one. Because remember, we're looking for the one that needs additional teaching, which means we're looking for the wrong answer choices. I need to check the client precisely. That word precisely means exactly, okay? Precisely at 15 minute intervals. You better not. You better not. Now, you better be checking on them within 15 minutes, but not at exactly 15 minute intervals. Because let me tell you something, they're not dumb. They start to realize that you're checking every 15 minutes. And so when they're suicidal, they know that the minute you walk out that door, they have a good 14 minutes at least to before you come back and check again, if they want to make sure that they are right. So you're not going to check at exactly 15 minutes. You want to check within 15 minutes. So you might check them in eight minutes and then you check them and then you leave and then you check again in 10 minutes. Then you check again in 12 minutes, but don't do it exactly because then they're going to, they're going to time you and then you're going to have another problem on your hands. And so that's why, um, number one is a correct answer. Choices number two, three, four are absolutely correct. These are true. And that's why we didn't choose them. We were looking for an answer choice that needed follow-up. When you see a question asking you, which one needs additional teaching? Which one needs follow-up? Which one would you question? What they're really asking you is what is the wrong answer choice? Which of the following activities should the nurse recommend to the client on an inpatient unit when thoughts of suicide occur? One, keeping track of feelings in a journal. Two, reading a magazine. Three, talking, talking with the nurse, excuse me, or four, playing a card game with other clients. And guys, the correct answer is three, talking with the nurse. Remember, depression is anger hostility and um, resentment turned towards self. 
You don't want it in the patient's body. You want them to get it out. That's why you want them to talk and express themselves. Number three, because guess what? The nurse knows therapeutic information, a therapeutic communication. So the nurse knows not to say to the patient, oh, you're so dumb. But if you do choice four, have them play a card game and they lose the card game, number one, that reinforces the thought, I'm so dumb. Remember, those patients who are, are, dep um, who are depressed, you don't give them anything to do that there's a chance that they'll fail or lose. That's number one. And number two, the person that they're playing the card game is in the psych unit with them. So I don't think that's the best person for depressing the person in depression to play a card game with because I don't think they're going to be therapeutic, right? You want the, the person who's severely depressed to play a card game and then they make a wrong move and the person they're playing with says something like, you are so dumb. Why would you do something like that? That'd be enough to throw them over the edge. So number four is wrong. And then choices number two, one and two, um, keeping track of feelings in the journal. They're by themselves doing that. And choice number two, reading in a mag reading a magazine. They're by themselves doing that. You want them interacting with you. You want them socializing with you, the nurse who knows how to use therapeutic communication with the patient. And that's why choice number three is the correct answer. Which of the following amounts of medication is appropriate for a client who's being treated with Tofranil on an outpatient basis for recurring depression and suicidal um, ideation to have at one time? One, a 30-day supply. Two, a 21-day supply. Three, a 14-day supply. Or four, a seven-day supply. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is four. A seven day supply. And even that I feel is a tad much. So this is a TCA. It's an antidepressant medication. And when the patient's being di um, discharged, guys, you want to only give them enough medication for a couple days because that forces them to go back to the healthcare provider for a refill so they can get follow up. They can be reassessed. That's number one. And number two, they can't take the whole bottle at one time and commit, right? So you're killing two birds with one stone. Number one, you're forcing them to go back to their healthcare provider to be reassessed for that follow-up in order to get the refill, to get the rest of the medications. And it prevents them from taking all of those medications at once. So that's why number four is the correct answer choice. The reason I keep saying, <sighs> I know this, when I say the S word, my videos get flagged. And I mean, it gets unflagged eventually, but I don't want to deal with the process. So that's why I'm saying that. But you guys know what I mean. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. The client with recurrent depression and suicide ideation tells the nurse, I can't afford this medication anymore. I know I'll be okay without it. The nurse should, one, inform the physician of the client's statement. Two, ask the social worker to find assistant, assistance for the client. Three, schedule a follow-up appointment in three months or four, ask the client whether a family member can help. And the correct answer is two, the social worker. Remember guys, the job of the social worker is to provide assistance and resources in the community for what? Financial issues. That's what they're for. Choice number one, inform the physician. Um, what's the physician gonna do? The physician ordered the meds. They're gonna look at you and say, okay, figure it out. They ordered the med. They're not going to not, they're not going to take the order back if, just because the patient said that they can't afford it. They need the resources. You're going to go to a social worker. You, what you can do though is ask that um, healthcare provider, ask for an order for a social work consult so they can get involved, but they need a social worker. Choice three, look at this. Schedule follow-up appointment in three months. They just told you they cannot afford that medication. If you schedule a follow-up in three months, in that time, that patient may be because they stopped taking their medication. They said they cannot afford that medication. You need to address that, okay? Choice number four, ask the client whether a family member could help. You don't pass the buck. They're telling you that they have issues. You are going to help them find the resources to help them. Not pass the buck to a family member. And guys, that is it for part two of the series. Please, in the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like me to cover more in detail. Don't forget daily, I 
do lessons. I teach about different topics. If there's something I haven't taught about yet that you'd like to see me teach about, please let me know in the comments section. Don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And almost daily, I cover a variety of nursing topics on my TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook um, platforms. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys to catch me on the next video.